I'm going to go ahead and get started. Yes, sir. Um, all right. So uh, thank you for another episode or for joining us uh, on another episode of uh, Parent Like a Professional, uh, PLP. Uh, today we have a guest, uh, uh, Horian Gracie, who is going to join us to talk a little bit about how he uh, has raised 10 children um, eat, so that they would eat healthy and so that they would exercise. Uh, uh, Horian Gracie has come from a long line of mixed mar martial artist fighters. Um, he is a grandmaster, red belt, and Gracie Jiu-Jitsu is the first born son of Elio Gracie. And uh, Horian, tell us a little bit more about um, your family background and, uh, and, and tell our audience a little bit more about um, what you've done from the time you came here from Brazil um, to the US. Well, thank you very much, all of you, for the opportunity. Uh, it's been an interesting ride, to say the least. Uh, my family's been doing Jiu-Jitsu for about 100 years. My uncle learned from a former Jiu-Jitsu instructor that came to Brazil in the early 1900s. And then he shared with his brothers, which included my father, who was the, the youngest of five boys. They all got into jiu-jitsu. My father eventually fine-tuned the techniques to make what we know today as Gracie or Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Um, the whole my uncle Carlos, as soon as his brothers started getting involved in jiu-jitsu, he kind of, you know, became the stop, took a step back from the actual fighting himself, became the manager for the brothers, and among other things, started studying nutrition because he realized back in the early 20s, the important correlation between good health and good performance. So in order to keep the family healthy so that they could uphold the Gracie challenge in matches against different styles of martial arts, Uncle Carlos starts spending time, like I said, studying the works of nutritionists, scientists, anybody who could put his hands on in terms of health, he would study their work. And after 65 years of research, he came up with a very interesting, a very unique, I shall say, way of combining foods at each meal so that you could be to do your best, okay? So that you'll be no heartburn, no headaches, no excess weight, and no gastritis or anything like that. So that you'll be healthy all the time. That was his main concern in developing the concepts of the Gracie diet. Of course, the family kept developing jiu-jitsu and challenge mats and all that kind of stuff. And I was born on that package. My uncle Carlos eventually had 21 kids. My father had nine children. And uh, so growing up with that family, what everybody trained jiu-jitsu, ate healthy, and our lives are just pretty much focused on that. It was a very Spartan lifestyle. I have to say that for me, the most influence, I mean, the biggest influence in my life in terms of being healthy and, and living the way I live today is because of the example I had at home. Example is not the best way to educate your kids. It's the only way. I can't light up a cigarette and try to tell my kids not to smoke. Or, you know, drink a beer and say, hey, don't drink. I mean, in other words, ultimately, it's up to the parents to, set, to have that kind of awareness and set up a standard. So that's what they do. And the kids grow up eating this. Never in my life, I opened a refrigerator and saw a beer or a bottle of wine. I'm not saying that people shouldn't drink. It's up to each one individual. But my father was trying to raise a group of champions, and he just didn't drink. And again, it's the, um, the environment that the kid grows up with that facilitates that. So you were saying your uncle Carlos had 21 children. Mm. He, uh, you, uh, your, your father had nine children, so you had 20 children. And you were saying that the biggest thing that uh, you were saying is leading by example. Uh, you know, you were, your family, your father, your uncle, they led by example. And so you were mentioning, you know, that's how you were doing that with your children is you would lead by example. How many children do you have? Not enough. <laughs> I have 10 kids and a horse. 10 kids and a horse. Okay. Yes. And uh, Rose is the oldest. And so how old is Rose right now? Uh, Rose is, is she, uh, 48. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. then your youngest is Hecon. How old is Hecon? 14. He was 14. 14. So a range of 14 to 48 years of age. So tell us a little bit about... Um, you know, how you introduced, like, you know, and you mentioned how it was introduced to you. So how did you keep them in the States? Because, you know, everything that you're telling and sharing with us, um, you know, you were an entrepreneur, you were busy from day one. So um, challenge matches, you know, starting in the garage, teaching jujitsu, starting the Gracie Academy, uh, which is huge now, and it's all over the world. Uh, and then, you know, one of the founder or the founder of the UFC or the Ultimate Fighting Challenge, you know, how did you take the time or where did you find the time, you know, to teach your, your children um, about um, eating healthy and about exercise and all that? Tell us a little bit about that. Um, again, I did, the kids did not have a choice. How's that? 
because I eat a certain way. I wake up for, in the for morning. I'll get a cantaloupe. I'll juice a fresh squeezed cantaloupe juice. Put it in the blender with a half a dozen bananas and the fl the flesh, the meat of the coconut. Blend that stuff in there. That's breakfast. So everybody eats that since they're little babies. My watermelon. When I was a baby, there was somebody blending watermelon juice with bananas for me. So I wasn't aware of what I was eating. I was just learning to eat the right thing. So as you grow up, you just eat like that. And at lunch, we usually have two meal, uh, meals of fruit a day and one meal of cooked food. Okay? So, you know, your fish or your steak or chicken or vegetables, stuff like that. I usually have that during the daytime because your metabolism is more active. So the kids grow up eating the same way I ate. As far as teaching classes, when I first started having kids, you know, in Brazil, I had them in Brazil a couple of degrees, my first marriage. But when I came here and I started teaching class out of my garage, um, I was having kids and the kids would eat the way I eat, go to school, come back and roll on the mat with me. So they, the exercise come from being brought into that environment. Usually if the uh, parent is an attorney or an engineer or a doctor, they can't bring the kid to the office to do their stuff. And their stuff, more often than not, is not exercise related activity. So I was fortunate enough to be blessed to be born in a family where our activity, our work was teaching jiu -jitsu. So the kids would be hanging out on the mat with me, training with me, doing that kind of stuff all their lives as they grew up, you know. And, uh, and the diet goes because when I had to eat, they ate with me and we ate the same kind of thing. So that was my way of keeping everybody involved in a way that was healthy physically and then health wise eating the right thing. So and they did not much our choice. I must say that uh, when I was very young, sometimes we go to a birthday party and uh I go there and do eat. the parents would give me a piece of cake to eat and I'd say, no, thank you very much. It's not time to eat for me to eat. From a very early age, five years old, telling an adult, no, it's not my time to eat. More often than not, the father would say, hey, call my dad. Say, Ellie, what's going on? It's a birthday party. Your son is not eating because he says it's not time to eat. What's going on here? My father, oh, it's okay. We have a special diet. Don't worry about that. Let him play with his friends and forget that. My dad would be smart enough, first of all, to almost brainwash us into the importance of eating healthy. From a very early age, that's not good for you. This is okay. This is not good. That kind of thing was very much drilled into our heads. You know, like I said, I opened the bar, the fridge of my house with fruits and vegetables and all kinds of stuff. There was no, you know, junk stuff in there at all. It was everything is the best quality possible. So that's how I grew up watching that kind of thing. And uh, my dad would be smart enough to feed us dinner before we went to the party. So I go in a full tummy. I would not be tempted to eat what's available because I'm hungry. So I say, eat dinner, and then I get there, I say, I just want to play, I already ate. It's easy for me to say no that way. So I did the <laughs> same thing with my kids, you know what I mean? Just growing up like this. Uh, Halloween, for example, I actually have a chapter of that on the book, how to keep the kids within the discipline. First of all, the most important thing is that the parent has to believe on it and do that himself. And that's number one rule. You know, if you eat, expect your kid to do exactly what you're eating. You can't just change them. If you don't have the habit of exercising, don't expect them to exercise. I mean, you, sometimes you're going to sign up the kid to a soccer team or to, you know, swimming lessons. And so you can do that. They push the kid into that direction. Hopefully they'll like it. Take him to a variety of different activities that they enjoy one or two or three of those. But if as a parent, you have the habit of walking or bike riding and stuff like that, it's a lot easier for the kid to fall into that. That's the trick. So keeping that in mind, I think is a very important suggestion for the potential parents that are going to be watching this, that they have to they have to like the idea of being healthy themselves so they can instill that mindset on their kids. They have to like the idea of being aware of what they eat so that they can share that knowledge with their kids. So that's what the example comes in, in my opinion, very important thing. Well, I was yeah. say, did you find it difficult because back in Brazil, you had a huge surrounding of your family and how people <laughs> live um, was one way, but here, in America, when you were raising your family, I don't know if you had that same, you know, network. So how did you kind of form that? Or I understand in your house, it was one way, but the kids go off to school and they're, you know, have a lot of other outside influences. Here's the trick, Monica, is to have the, the, the wife or the husband on the same team. I find that uh, my kids, they all grew up eating like this. I know that today, some of them follow it hard, easier than others. Because sometimes the wife say, well, I don't like this, I don't like that. And if they don't want to they don't make a point of doing that, emphasizing the importance of it. For me, it's life and death. There's no way that I, you know, with all due respect to everybody, I would get married to a woman that goes against the idea on the diet. 
wouldn't do it. It's yeah. not going to work. Yeah, I was going to ask you one of the questions I had um, was uh, in terms of I know all ten of your children, um, but I how many grandchildren do you have? Right Four, now, Horia? Fourteen. Fourteen. Yeah. And so, and one of the questions I had was, you know, are you know the the you know your ten children are they following the Gracie diet and are they you know, following it through, you know, with the uh, the grandchildren, but you're saying some of them are following it, some of them are not, but it's, you know, one of those I'm, things where, you know, both parents have to be involved and in, yes. uh, making sure they follow the diet, yeah. yeah. Exactly. I remember, I myself remember asking my uncle Carlos when I was very young, say, what if a person on the Grace family decides not to do the diet? You know, what if a guy leaves it? Because growing up with a big house with everybody else and, you know, that was a, a, the family compound and we lived in Rio, but go back to the house frequently to hang out everybody together. And he said, Hold on, I remember that these guys spent the first you know, 20 years of their lives living at the house with the family compound or with us. So for the first 20 years, they have the big step of being healthy for that time and they learn how to do it. If they eventually decide not to follow the diet anymore, they're going to suffer the consequence of their new bad eating habit. They can always go back to what they've learned or stick to that and do whatever it is. But it's an individual's choice to do that. I know that even within the Greasy family, I am very strict on how I eat today. You know what I'm saying? Some I got more stricter than others. Some people do that. But I see the benefits every single day of my life. No, absolutely not. Maureen, you mentioned um, a couple of years ago, we were talking a little bit about um, with your youngest and my youngest. And I was asking you like, hey, I'm trying to figure out how I can get my son more so interested in doing Mm -hmm. And I think he's just doing it because he really wants to spend time with me. And you you said something and you shared something in terms of how you did it with your youngest son. And you were talking about how you make it playful. Can you talk a little bit about that in terms of encouraging him to exercise or do jujitsu or something? Tell yeah. us how you did that. Yeah. Um, you know, like me, sometimes I didn't want to go to the academy. There was a kid there who was a little stronger than me. Every time I show up, they give, give me a hard time. I said, I don't want to go. And my father always found a way to get us inspired and motivate us and through playfulness and that kind of stuff. So I grew up going through that same experience. My kids sometimes don't want to go. You know, I don't want to go there in this today. So there was a little bit of pressure that I put on them. So I'm like, okay, you don't have to go to the academy. You can stay in your room until I come back. Ah, I don't want to stay in the room. So, okay, I'll go to the academy. You know, that kind of stuff. Because for them, I, it's, I needed to, do, to learn Jiu-Jitsu. They have to do Jiu-Jitsu. It's too important. You know, sometimes the kid doesn't understand I don't want to exercise. I want to be in the video game all day. Sometimes I have to deal, you know, with Hiko on that. Say, no, you got to exercise. We exercise. Tomorrow you got the phone to play. If not, forget it. So I'm playing all these kind of games with the kids so they can get eventually into that. So the idea of playfulness, if there's a TV commercial, for example, happening, you know, if the kid is very young, now they're all bigger than me almost, but if the kid is very young, I'll be on my force, Eric, like this you know, on the TV, on, on the on the carpet, and let the kid hang on my back as if he's riding a horse, hooking the legs and grabbing onto my neck, and I'll be jumping around so that he can get a good sense of balance and play with that kind of stuff. I'll do a jiu-jitsu move or two with him on the spot, and then let him go. You know, just like that. You know, 15, you know, seconds, little move. And then another commercial, another, fit, just escape, have them, get him a move on him so he gets one little move and goes away. The idea is, to stop before he gets bored and tired. You play with just enough that he stops. Before he says, I don't want to do it anymore, I said, enough, I'm tired. You already beat me up too much today. So that I always keep the kid on that little, you know, if it's going to be, let's see who can do 10 push-ups faster or, or 10 sit-ups. And do it as long as all you want again. Gosh, I want to do next time I want to win. So, you know what I'm saying? Let's see who can score basketball here in the backyard, you know, faster or do it quicker or more times. So I'm always letting the kid win to get him encouraged and winning is good and that kind of stuff. Once in a while, I win just for him put him back to reality. But the idea of encouraging the kid in a playful way without, you know, him getting tired. I don't want to do it anymore. I can't take this anymore. In jiu-jitsu, for example, I oriented parents to train with their kids, play with their kids for as much years of age they have. So if the kid is like three years old, I play with him for three minutes. That's it. It's not going to be a half an hour because he's going to get bored. He can't stand that. He gets, I don't care what it is, he's going to get tired. It's a five-year-old kid. I'm not playing with him more than five minutes. 
whatever that is, if it's basketball, whatever it is, that's the part I push for. And then I say, thank you very much. If you say, let's do more, let's do more, Dad, I say, okay, well, another minute I'll play with you, but then you're getting too good at this. So I'm always kind of teasing the kid so that he's always kind of chasing to, to get him more. But I say, no, not right now. Let's do it again. Or we'll do it later in the next commercial or tomorrow, whatever it is. But playing just a little bit to get him involved, exposed to the idea, but stopping right before he says, I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah, that's brilliant. I love it. I love it. So they're, they're always leaving with um, the feeling that they had a good time and that right. it's fun and it's yeah. not work. It's all about it's play and fun. I exactly. love it. Yeah. Right. I know one of the questions we had, um, you know, Monica, your daughter is in gymnastics, correct? So you, yeah. were, you were, we were talking a little bit about, um, you know, what is the best thing to do before a competition or before training? Maybe you can ask Corian, you know, specifically the questions you had about, um, you know, what you had for your daughter in gymnastics. Yeah, so she's she's currently, you know, having these, they usually go for three and four hour long, um, you know, times because they have to rotate and they do all the stretches and exercises. And I'm trying to figure out the right foods to help fuel um, her body so that she can excel. Um, because I do understand that, you know, she can't be at her best unless she has, you know, good, good food. So um, I've been reading up on the Gracie diet and just trying to figure out what kinds of things I should be giving to her before, during, after. Um, it's a it's a good question. It's a very common question. You know, Monica, a lot of people say, what do I do as a pre-train, you know, before my workout or after the workout, what should I eat then? Here's the deal. I never had a pre or after workout meal. There's no such a thing. I had breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's it. She's not going to be weaker and perform weaker if she doesn't have a little snack before the training. That doesn't happen. It's not true. It's crucial that we keep how old is she? She's nine. She's nine. Okay, kids should keep a meal, a uh, space between three and uh, four hours apart. Okay. okay. So at nine years old, she, you might, I don't know what time she wakes up, what time she goes to sleep, but at four hours apart, she might be able to feed four meals in a day. You know, but after 12 years old, 12, 13 years old, or something like that, three meals a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Then you fit the schedule of the activity in between those spaces. But you don't have to necessarily give her lunch at noon and then at two o'clock feed her something so that she can be ready for a three o'clock class. Don't do that because the space in between the noon and the two o'clock snack is not going to be four and a half hours. Do you follow me? Yes. It is more important to space your meals and let the kid squeeze the exercise in between than necessarily make a point of feeding her something right after the exercise or, you know, or, or right before the exercise. Don't worry about that. Now, when, when your kids are in school or when they're, you know, and they have to kind of conform a little bit to the schedule, um, how do you, how do you adjust or is it things that they can eat that are pretty easy to take on the go if they're not at home? A uh, great question too. Um, I usually make for my kid, Hikon, he yeah. goes to school, I get some grapes, some sweet grapes, like Moscatel grapes. That's what I had for him. I wash the grapes, fill a little plastic container with grapes on it. I have, uh, piece of whole wheat bread. I put a little bit of cream cheese on it. And then I get some dates, some medjool dates, wash the dates, take the skin off, take the seed off, and I make a date date cream cheese sandwich for him. I toast the bread, put that, and I put a little, a little pack that you have, you know, the cold packs kind of stuff, that you put a little ice thing in there to hold it cold and then send it to school with him. He has breakfast at like 7.30 in the morning at the house. Eats at 11.30, 12 o'clock at school, comes home at 4 o'clock, has lunch, and then 8 o'clock, 8.30, has dinner. Amazing. All right. So it could, apple, it could be an apple with a banana. You know, there's a whole bunch of different fruits that you can have available that you can do. But if it's a sandwich, I used, they like that little sweet dates. And stuff. Snacking in between is just kind of the thing that really needs to be cut out in the pre, post, during. Yeah. Not, not necessary. That. Yes. Mm -hmm. For adults as well. There's no such a thing as eating three meals a day. I mean, three, every three hours. It's absolutely insane. Some doctors recommend you eat every three hours. It's, it's, absolutely, it's crazy. Don't do that. You don't need to. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Doreen, you've been following, um, you've been eating healthy your whole life. You've been exercising your whole life. Um, you know, tell us about your, your your experience down in Colombia. Tell us, you know, uh, what brought you down to Colombia and and uh, what you found in terms of some of the uh, testing that they did on uh, your health and on, and on your body. Well, what happens is that uh, mission is a little briefly earlier. 
um, because of jujitsu, my shoulders and knees are pretty much worn out, like bone on bone. You know, the joints are gone. So I did some research and I found that in Colombia they do this this uh, stem cell treatment where they, uh, you know, where you're allowed to use the stem cell from the umbilical cord, which are more potent. So I went to Colombia and they did the injections on my shoulders and my knees and my back and so forth, um, in the hopes that the the joints will be kind of you know regrow at least some of it. Um, while there. They put me on a machine that reads the body age. I step on a machine, reach out, reach down the machine, pull up a handle that has a little cable connected to the base and a metal handle. And the lady, the doctor enters my date, my age, weight, and height. And the machine reads your body age. So at that time, last year, I was 70 years old. And the machine read, my body is at 45 years old. And I asked her, why do you think that? She said, have, absolutely has to do with your diet, which it doesn't surprise me at all, you know, that the diet has that kind of positive feedback because that's the idea. Ultimately, you want to you wanna live for as long as you can as a young guy and then die. You don't want to be deteriorating as you get older. You know, all of us know someone that as they get older and get more frail, the body starts to kind of eh, shrink down a little bit. And it's painful for them who are going through that moment and experience that kind of weakness. And it's painful for us because there's not much we can do. Uh, and what I've seen in the Gracie diet is my uncle Carlos, who lived until he was like 92 or 93 years old, healthy until he died. My father, six months before my father passed away, he was 94 and a half. He died at 95. I went to visit him on his ranch in Brazil at 94 and a half. I landed on, and I got to the Brazil and landed, I went to visit him on his ranch. I get to the place, he gives me a kiss and said, hold on, let's go on the mat. I want to show a new choke I'm working on. <laughs> At 94 and a half and kick my butt, you know. So for me, which I grew up watching this example in my household, I can't, you know, there, I'm sure there's all kinds of different healthy diets out there. But personally, I haven't seen anything that gets slow to the Gracie diet. It's a very convincing point when I see something like that. And now at 70, the, the machine reads that my body feels like a 45-year-old, which is ridiculous. You know what I'm saying? So all I'm saying to you is this diet, somewhere in there, there's magic. You know, I can't prove anything because I'm not a doctor. The diet hasn't been scientifically proven. But the results of people who do it, they follow it, is absolutely incredible. So Amazing. I, have a, I have a question. Um, yeah. How, what are your recommendations for people that like, it sounds great, like, you know, obviously, you know, like you have good outcomes, like your personal life and then with your family, like, what are your recommendations for people that want to get started? Like, do you recommend that they just get right to it? Or is that all in your book of like how to gradually build that diet into your lifestyle? Brilliant question. The book has everything in here. Okay. It's all in there. Lights right there. Now in the back of the book, because changing one's eating habits, Stephanie, is one of the most difficult things there is. Food is one of the great pleasures of life, as we know, right? Mm -hmm. so, tastes good, I like people. It's an immediate result. If you're upset, you eat something, you feel better, you know, that kind of thing. There's all that psychological thing that is behind the food, the pleasure of eating. But knowing that how difficult it is to change one's eating habits, that's why people just eat what they eat, they keep on going on that. I have wrote the book, the first uh, version that you have, Monica, and people say, oh, I have your book. I have your book. I said, well, you're doing it. Well, not really. It's hard to change, to your point. It's very difficult to change one's eating habits because it's only, like I said, you just like what you like. Last thing you want, people say, hey, stop eating that dessert you like. Or, don't eat your ice cream anymore. Don't do it. You know, shut up. What I want to eat what I want to eat. So, but you have to find a happy medium in there. So talking to a friend of mine who's a marketing expert, he said, when you teach a class in jiu-jitsu, what kind of people can you teach? I said, anybody. I don't care if, who the person is. If they come to my class, they will learn because the student is not the, I don't rely on the student's ability to become good. I rely on my ability to be able to teach. There's no such a thing as a bad student. There are good teachers and bad teachers. Since I'm a good teacher, he's going to learn no matter what. That's been my philosophy of life all my life. On that note, the guy said, create a way that you facilitate the access to this person who's learning about the diet so that there's no excuse for them not to do it. You take the responsibility or figure out a way to do it. So after a lot of thinking, I came up with a very interesting way, which is this one here. Look, there's a belt system. See white, blue, purple, brown, and black, just like the jiu-jitsu scene. Mm. So it's a very gradual process. Got it. That's the trick. The basic rules on the Gracie diet, 
the basic rules are number one, do not mix starches. In other words, you don't eat rice and beans or bread and potato. Hamburger and French fries are a horrible combination. You can have three hamburgers, but no French fries. Or two bags of French fries and the, and the meat, but no, no bread. So the potato and the bread is not a good combination. Everybody in Brazil eats rice and beans. I never eat rice and beans. Oh my gosh, you have no idea what you're missing. Well, I feel great. I don't, I don't feel sick ever. So that's what I'm missing. Anyway, that's the way I see it. <clears throat> Rule number one, don't mix starches. Rule number two, when you eat a cooked food, cooked food that's prepared with oil or fat or butter or something, you know, your steak, your potatoes, your vegetables, you know, pasta, lasagna, whatever you eat, you should not eat sugar. So oil and fat do not combine. There's no dessert when you feed a cooked meal. I'm not saying you can't eat sweets. I love sweets. My dates and honey and stuff like that, fruits, all that. But don't have a fruit after a meal. Isn't fruit good for you? Yes, it's very good for you if you combine it properly. <coughs> you know what I mean? Not as a dessert. So don't mix starches. Don't eat cooked food with sweets. Oil and fat do not combine. Okay, if you're going to eat fruit, it's going to be a separate meal than the one you had made with oil or butter or fat. Or and you're saying oil and fat or oil and sugars? <laughs> I'm sorry, oil and sugars. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. okay. So in other words, that's why there's no food, no fruit or, or you know, sweets or ice cream after a meal. And the third basic rule is that you must keep a space at least four and a half to five hours in between meals. So you finish eating something at eight o'clock, don't eat anything before one. Now, if it's a kid below 12 years old, then you could be four and a half, four hours apart. But never less than that. Unless it's a little baby, then you eat three hours like that, and you know, that stuff is okay. But as the kids grow up, start eating actual food, you want to space your meals to four and a half, four hours apart. So those are the basic concepts. And as far as this, the gradual approach, my recommendation is as a white belt, is to drink a glass of water in the morning, wake up in the morning, glass of water. And I recommend that you leave the empty glass on the little table next to your bed. What do you mean, leave the empty glass? Because the whole idea is to re-educate yourself. If you drink the glass in the morning and take it to the kitchen, at night you're going to forget, and the next morning you're not going to have it. But if you leave the empty glass next to your bed, when you go to bed, ah, I need my water for tomorrow, and you bring the water again. That's the concept. So that's one. Number one. Number two, <clears throat> first one, drink a glass of water. Number two, wash your hands before each meal. Come on, you have go to a business meeting, work all day, hi, shake hands with everybody, go sit in the restaurant. They bring a little basket with warm bread and butter. You're starving. You're going to get the bread, get the butter to eat without having washed your hands. Come on. Make a point of washing your hands and then sit down and eat all, as much bread as you want. You follow me? So make a point of washing your hands. And the third thing I recommend as a white belt is during the first week, to write down everything you eat, everything you drink, and at what time. In other words, do an x-ray of your current eating habits so that you can put that away, pull in the drawer, and then six months back, you can look back and say, no wonder I was feeling sick. Look what I was eating then. So that's the white belt, and then goes into blue belt, purple belt, brown belt, that kind of thing. But it's a very gradual. So if you're drinking a glass of water in the morning, not lemon water, just plain water, like drink a glass of water in the morning, and you wash your hands before you eat, you're already on a greasy diet. <laughs> So, Aaron, the biggest things which I love and what you were sharing, like the idea that you came from a large family and then you've had 10 of your own children, 14 grandchildren. You know, the big biggest thing I'm getting out of all of this is you're saying lead by example. You know, when it comes to, you know, how you eat and it, when it comes to how you exercise, lead by example. Uh, when it's exercise, keep it short, make it fun, be playful. Yes. And that's how you've encouraged your 10 children you know, over the years. And I, yeah. and I love the, uh, the you know, how you're sharing um, with us, how you've uh, led by uh, example. And I think that's where we fall short as parents. A lot of the times we struggle, we want our children to do something, yeah. but yet we're not doing it ourselves. So how can we have those expectations of our children? So I love, you know, the fact that if you want your children to eat healthy, then you have to model that. If you want them to exercise, you have to model that and make it fun and playful and stop short of, you know, um, you know, them getting bored or frustrated or whatnot and letting them win and letting them feel good about them. And every once in a while, That's um, right. like you said, letting them feel reality and, and you win every <laughs> once in a while. But 
Uh, I love those uh, strategies and thank you, you know, so much for sharing that. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah, the trick is that. And again, you know, once you start looking at this way, <clears throat> we start as parents to realize that we have to make an effort to kind of set the standard of what it is. You know, you can't be a bad example and hope the kid's going to be okay. It's not. You have to really, and ultimately, the, the correction has to come from each one of us. You know what I'm saying? You have to make an effort. If I, if I eat junk, my kid's going to eat junk. So you have to start disciplining yourself and changing yourself and improving yourself so that you can hope that you kind of give that example to the kids, you know? That's the idea. So it's a continuous work, work in progress. Yeah. And then mom and dad have to be on the same page as well. You know, and you okay. mentioned that earlier, I think. They have to work as a team to make sure that they can role model it, you know, for the children, for the family as a whole. Yeah, if you find the father or the mother is doing something and the father doesn't do it, they confuse the kid. <clears throat> it's really not good at all. They have to be on the same page. Okay. And, uh, Brian, you mentioned at one point in uh, some previous conversations we've had um, that you have, uh, you're have you developing an app so to make it easier for people to find the right combinations in the Gracie diet. Have you guys released that app yet? Not yet, but I have the basic guidelines, which I'm going to send you, Eric, and you please share with the team, which is sure. you, you, when you pick rice, it automatically eliminates the other starches. So you can't pick beans if you want anymore. It's already got that. It's a, it's kind of a beta stage. I think that's what you call it. It's developing, but that part is ready, and I can't wait to share with you. So that there's no excuse. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. We appreciate it. Well, yes. Thank you, Oran, for sharing uh, your time with us. We really appreciate it. We know your time is it's very valuable, and we uh, we appreciate all the knowledge that uh, you're passing down. Um, hopefully that. Uh, the idea that um, eating healthy and, and, and exercise is a, obviously a very important part of uh, longevity. And, you know, you've shared with us what they shared with you in Colombia. You have uh, the body of a 45-year-old, and I think that's amazing. Um, so yeah. congratulations on that. But we uh, appreciate your time, and uh, we appreciate the um, audience joining us for um, this episode of PLP. Uh, once again... If you guys have any questions or if you're interested in the Gracie diet, um, Horian, if you could hold up your book really quick, you can purchase the uh, second edition of the Gracie diet. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's really not that hard to follow. I've followed it. I'm uh, following most everything, but there's one part that I'm not following. I still eat, you know, pork. Uh, but other than that, I follow the diet. Uh, uh, Man, you know. Whatever you're doing is working for you, Eric. You look great. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> But again, thank you for joining us, Orion. And uh, you know, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, post them on our uh, on a, the blog or the website, and we'd be happy to answer them. Um, so, uh, Stephanie, Marquis, Monica, thank you for joining us uh, in today's episode, and uh, we will see you soon. Take care. Thank you very much, all of you. Once again, good to see you. Take care. All the best. Yeah, thank you.